it should just be the norm. There's so many other things where people prepay or um, have to give deposits and things like I just think why aren't restaurants that the costs and us are, are so significant and um, and the margins are so thin you know it can really cripple the business if people no show you know like you speak to other businesses that you know they have up to 20% no show rate it's just um, it's like pretty disgusting really this is the deep in the weeds podcast I'm Anthony Huckstep. Uncertainty has an unrelenting way of affecting everything you do. With cases rising, Victoria went into the harshest lockdown ever seen down under and put all the other cities on notice. As those in Melbourne navigate a difficult and worrying landscape, what challenges are its sibling cities facing? Tristan Rosier is the co-owner of Arthur Restaurant in the Sydney suburb of Surrey Hills. Tristan, with the lockdown of stage four in Melbourne, how are you feeling in Sydney operating a restaurant at the moment? Uh, a little bit nervous. Um, we're definitely um, sort of keeping a very close eye on things. It feels like it seems to be creeping a little bit closer and closer now um, with a couple of places not too far away from us getting some people coming in that are testing positive for COVID. So I suppose we're just trying to, um, you know, every day we're sort of rolling the dice on whether someone might come into our restaurant um, despite doing everything we can to sort of keep distance and, you know, follow all the correct procedures. Um, you can't really help it if, like, that one person comes in other than short of just, like, switching back to a takeaway model or just not opening really. So just try to balance, um, you know, keeping the business open but also keeping everybody safe as well. So You've been open again for a, a little period of time now. Have you noticed an impact given what's happening in Melbourne and the spot sort of cases in Sydney? Yeah, definitely we're starting to see sort of the echoes of what was happening back in March when um, sort of it was it was more so led by I feel like um, sort of media fear and people's fear in general of, of like the uncertainty and what could happen. And, and um, we're definitely seeing um, a lot of sort of last minute cancellations or, um, and, and, but in the, on the same hand, like last minute bookings as well. Um, a lot of people are sort of being more vocal and calling up and sort of uh, checking a bookings policy to see how late they can cancel and how they feel on the day. Um, like for example, um, our capacity is 52 people um, on a uh, Saturday or well, well, any day now, but, um, you know, on a Saturday we're often full and that's over two sittings. So um, what we're seeing is that to do 52, you probably have to attract, you know, 80 plus people to actually be full because you're going to get so many cancellations um, leading up to it. So, wow. um, yeah, and that was similar to what was happening, you know, before the, the lockdown. So, um, we're sort of definitely starting to see that kind of happen again, which has put us on alert a little. And, um, yeah, we're just sort of kind of ready with a, a counter move back into takeaway at a moment's notice. So that's sort of the, at the forefront of our minds. And, um, yeah, we're just going to do what we can do, right? What's it been like trading through this period – I know your restaurant model was a little bit unique when you first launched with a, a – a sort of a set menu, but it's also shared um, without it being a degustation. It was um, an interesting model. That, um, is, is that one that you kept during this period or have you changed things to adapt? Um, <clears throat> no, we've kept the same model. Um, we've just sort of had to adapt some price points and um, impose some minimum spends and things. Um, it's sort of based on really how many, how many people we could do, like when we first – could reopen as a restaurant it kind of wasn't really a decision that we would have um probably done for only 10 people um our takeaway business model was working quite well um but as soon as they announced that you could open and do 10 customers um, our like takeaway business dropped by 70 percent, and the phone just wouldn't stop ringing so we filled up for two months at 10 people per sitting so 20 people a day um and 30 on the weekends. Um, so, it, you know, it was it was challenging. And something that we had to consider was um, doing a set menu. It takes us, uh, well, the diners, like two and a half odd hours to eat it all. So 
um, we couldn't just squeeze an extra sitting in, you know, otherwise you have to have people turning up at like 4 p.m. in the afternoon or people turning up, you know, after 10 p.m. and these kinds of things. So um, it wouldn't really work. But um, so what we had to do is impose minimum spends. And then as the amount of people we could fit into the space grew, then we removed those um, those minimum spends. And um, it's been working quite well now, actually. Um, being able to do 52 people a day um, is actually quite a nice number. Before, we sort of had to um, really cram the place full of people to, to make it all work. And now I think we're going to be dealing with uh, people <clears throat> not necessarily wanting to sit so close to each other for quite some time. So um, I think I think we're just going to have to adapt to, um, you know, doing less customers and, and, and making that work financially. But I think what I'm seeing is that everything has been quite positive uh, as far as that's concerned so far. Long before the pandemic, a notable restaurant critic publicly complained about having to prepay a deposit when booking at your restaurant. And yet now it's a model many have turned to in the pandemic. What's what's your thoughts about that, and and why did you introduce it originally? Well, it wasn't um, so much born here. Um, we uh, had been doing that when I was working previously at Farmhouse, which has been open for seven odd years now. Um, I remember when Mike Musang and myself were running that business. Um, he still owns it, but I'm no longer involved there. But he, um, we had a, a situation uh, where we had a table of twenty, which is basically it's the whole the whole venue there is 20 seats and and they booked the whole place and and did a no show on a Saturday night. And we were just like, (laughs) just absolutely crippled. So um, that happened on like in our first month. And then we basically from that point started taking the credit cards and things. Um, And it has worked very well ever since. I mean, what it does do is people who aren't willing to give the details well, you don't take their booking and then they weren't likely to be actually turning up in the first place because what's the deal? Like if all you have to do is give us 24 hours notice to cancel if you want to cancel. So, you know, it's, it's not that big of an ask. It's just a sort of courtesy. Um, and um, so it was, it was born there and, and I saw it work so well um, that, you know, going out on my own and, and uh, I think particularly with a set menu type business, you know, um, when you make the booking, that's you placing your order with the kitchen. So we're actioning all of that food. And, you know, the re- it's, the, it's for those reasons that we are able to, to cook the, the ingredients that we, we do at such a, a good price point is because there's no wastage. And um, we, we, you know, as far as things like, um, you know, staff, um, you know, if we're not very busy that day, well, they don't need to prep as much food. So then they, they just don't come in as early, you know, so it, it can get that into alignment as well. Whereas an a la carte model, you know, it's, it's kind of just the will of the gods, whether you're busy or not today, or whether you sell, you know, sell out a chicken and you've got left all this fish that you spent all day prepping, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, uh, yeah, I guess to get back to your question, um, the credit cards here, um, was always going to be part of the model and I was actually I'm still just was surprised that not more people would do it because I felt like we were the outlier um, whereas um, you know if, if more people did it I think it wouldn't be such a weird thing and I, and I think it, it should just be the norm there's so many other things where people prepay or um, have to give deposits and things like I just think why aren't restaurants that the costs and are are so significant and um and the margins are so thin you know it can really cripple the business if people no show you know like you speak to other businesses that you know they have up to 20 percent no show rate it's just um it's like pretty disgusting really (laughs) um so with with having um like a pretty prominent (laughs) reviewer come in and write something on their twitter saying that basically uh, my business would fail within two years because we're doing this kind of thing. I thought it was just pretty out of order. <laughs> he was just saying that, um, you know, most operators have about 20% of no-shows. What's what's the current sort of no-show with the model that you have? Uh, it's less than 1%. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it works really well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, how have you felt about the, all the various models that have been coming out during the pandemic? 
uh, you know, something that you've been sort of working on and using for quite a while and seen this is something where people have felt, okay, it's time that we can actually speak out? Yeah, I think I think it's definitely um, made people sort of vocalise what, or, or maybe look at things a little bit differently. Um, I'm talking about people in the industry. Um, like Mark Jensen was talking about his, you know, new model of doing a set menu or I think he called it like a, um, uh, like a banquet menu. Um, you know, I think um, it, it works really well for, for dining restaurants. Um, I think initially I was like, oh, damn it, that's my point of difference gone. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone's cooking something different and they have a different experience and a different offering. So um, I think um, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing. You know, if it's going to mean that, like I know that it's a more sustainable business model. Um, I think that if that's going to mean that, um, you know, you can do more with less and um, that is the sort of reshuffle of the industry that, um, people have been talking about that we've been needing, you know, that's going to bring into alignment, you know, all of the, um, industrial relations issues and, and, um, you know, staff hours and, um, wastage and all of these things that you have to be now to be a, a top restaurant, you know, there's so much pressure to be ethical and, and, and all of these things. Um, so I think if, if more people are going to, going to go down that path, I think it's probably not a bad way to go. Your restaurant is in Surrey Hills and it's been some notable, amazing, award-winning restaurants in that suburb and it's been known as a, a food uh, capital of Sydney at some stages, but your restaurant's in more of a residential part of, of Surrey Hills. What's, what's it been like trading through this period? How important have those sort of locals been for you? I guess looking in hindsight, we've been really lucky because um, our business model has always been to be a neighbourhood place. Um, I've always wanted it to be somewhere where you could come and celebrate, you know, where if you, you know, had your relatives come from out of town or, you know, it was date night or whether it was a birthday or something, you know, you didn't have to go to a, a big city restaurant to have a good meal. You could have that right at your doorstep. Um, and I guess now more than ever, um, all of those locals are getting behind it and, you know, people that are stuck at home, you know, um, even now that you can come out of it to a restaurant, I suppose, like there's, there's still people are definitely at home more often. Um, so the fact that they don't have to go into the city or anything like that to get a good meal, um, is sort of played to our favor. Um, we, uh, yeah, I guess we really want to, um, I guess thank we'll take the opportunity now to thank everyone who's supported us throughout this. Like I feel we've had so much support from all of our locals. Um, they've, they've like people coming in like five nights a week for our takeaway when we were doing it. And even now when we're reopen, you know, just seeing all of those regulars come back in again and those familiar faces and, um, and, and what I didn't realize is they appreciated us as much as we appreciated them, you know, with doing, the takeaway food, you know, people were coming in and saying like, thank God you're doing this. I'm working my ass off at home. Um, working more now than ever. Cause I'm, I don't turn my laptop off till seven o'clock at night or whatever. And I can just come and grab dinner and it's delicious and it's healthy. And, you know, um, it really made us think that there's nothing off the table for what we would possibly do out of the venue. Um, particularly through these uncertain times, um, you know, if people show interest, like, why wouldn't we consider doing it? Whereas maybe before all of this, I guess we were pretty like set on a trajectory and I was pretty, you know, strong headed of like what I wanted it to be. Whereas now it's kind of like whatever works, we'll kind of give a go, but with our, you know, same intention to detail and the same sort of philosophy. Your food is a part of the new wave of contemporary Australian dining how would you describe the sort of food that you're doing there at Arthur um I guess like it's really led by the produce you know we um we try and just cook simple um like quite simply but just have a bit of like finesse so just actually um sort of take the time and and apply the techniques that will give us the best result and just it requires a bit of a fair bit of testing and often sometimes you know the um the most simple looking things are actually the most difficult. 
uh, there's not really anywhere to hide. Um, you know, we, we always, you know, I think it's sort of beating an old drum. Everyone's sort of saying like it's hyper local produce and all of this stuff, but it just makes sense to use that. I mean, to me, that's like the obvious thing. Um, you know, we just want to cook what's good at the time and we just want to cook things that we enjoy to cook and enjoy to eat. And, you know, if it's a pain in the ass, we just, we'll just take it off the menu cause it's too hard. You know, we, we're not silly like that. We want to just enjoy the, enjoy the process. It's quite, um, collaborative. It's not like I'm just coming up with all of the food, you know, it's like definitely every single person has a voice and a way of doing things. And, you know, when I have my staff, I look at it as, you know, everyone's got a brain and everyone's worked in all these amazing places. Like surely these people have seen techniques that I've not seen. So why not apply those as well? And I can learn something too. Um, you know, so I always sort of, it's hard to put the food in a nutshell, but I would say like, it's kind of the sum of the parts of the people who were there at the time, you know, and, you know, I could give examples of restaurants I've worked in where those restaurants were the sum of the chefs working there at the time, like working back at Est in like 2010, you know, there was some really, really amazing talent back then in that kitchen. And, um, you know, it was at the time a three hat restaurant and I think the sum of its parts. So, you know, um, the food at Arthur will continually change based on who's working here and, and those influences. So, um, it's really a team effort. And I think, you know, we just want to keep it simple and delicious and, um, and quite light. You know, I think now people are really not super into eating heaps of meat and that kind of thing, but what they do eat, they want to eat really high quality, you know, whether it's fish or seafood or, 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 or you know, meats, ducks, whatever, um, you know, people want to eat a lot more vegetables, but they want to eat those, those meats, but super high quality and less of it. So we're definitely, um, preparing a lot more vegetables, um, which is quite enjoyable and challenging. I think vegetables are quite tricky. So, um, it's quite, it's quite, um, enjoyable. You said you'll do whatever works at the moment. What's something that you've done during the pandemic that worked that you never thought would work? Ah, interesting. Um, so the takeaway model, I was kind of like in the beginning, like, I remember we we sort of sat down. I would, had a really honest conversation, like I'm sure a lot of other business owners did at the time, about what we would do um, during the lockdown. And it was kind of like, well, there's two options here, guys. We can just sort of sit on the sidelines and do nothing, or we can try a takeaway model. Um, and what do you guys think about that? And uh, of course, all of my staff that are from overseas who you know, aren't eligible for JobKeeper and things were like very keen to do something. So, um, which I was kind of surprised about. Um, and we decided to do the takeaway thing. And, um, at that point it was like, okay, if we're going to do it, we're going to go head on into this thing. And it was probably like three days of like just sheer panic and running around trying to assemble everything and suppliers not supplying things and having to drive halfway around town to get everything to launch this, um, takeaway model, um, which I had no idea would work. And, uh, yeah, of course it did pretty well in the end. And we were just, it was just constantly like every day it was just like, just trying to make it happen and trying to make it work. It's like in the kitchen we have is so small and not really kitted up to be cooking like a hundred meals and each meal feeds two people, you know, 200 odd people a day. Um, you know, we had to buy things like, a, like a paddle to s stir like s the sauces in the stock pot and things like literally stand on a ladder and like stir this with like a 1.5 meter long paddle. Like I've never done that, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't know whether all of that would work or whether all of that hard work would just be for nothing. Um, but in the end it was like, it was really successful and you know, we, you know, every couple of days we're coming up with a new product to sell, you know, we, we were just selling wine out of the front and then, you know, we thought, why don't we try it, make some like pre-batched cocktails. And then in the end, you know, I placed an order for a thousand bottles of, wow, um, to make these pre-batched cocktails, you know, and like we just sold them. It's just so many. It's just like, I couldn't believe that <laughs> that people would want this stuff, but I, I guess like they just were doing nothing else. You know, they, some people were still, working from home and earning money and just like were just so bored out of their brain that they were just, I guess, <laughs> trying to make their own entertainment somehow and those cocktails might have helped. <laughs> you mentioned uh, how important 
quality produce is that underpins your cooking? You know, how important have the relationships with your suppliers and producers been during the pandemic? Yeah, that's um, yeah, it's been pretty important actually. Um, you know, to give you an example, managing our relationship with Vix was pretty important um, because that was what allowed us to do the, you know, the, the takeaway, um, was being able to get our hands on a lot of meat and things and, um, same with our veg suppliers. Um, so, you know, they just flat out stopped, um, delivering. So, you know, we had to go and, um, pick up all the meat, um, like twice a week, I'd fill up my little Volkswagen golf to the roof. It was be sagging in, in the rear full of, you know, 80, 90 kilos of meat, um, for the week. And, um, <laughs> it's pretty sketchy. Um, <laughs> but you know, like everything was, you know, just went straight back to, to paying cash straight up or, you know, paying, paying for it, um, when you received it or picked it up. Um, you know, it's the same with veg and, um, I feel like there was a lot of people not paying their bills and, you know, understandably, but, um, making sure that, you know, we paid everyone up front and, you know, I think it was um, it, w- it was it was good for us as well. It was like wholesome for us to stay open to also keep those people paid as well, you know, because that's like that's the chain. That's how it all works. And you know, if we just stop because we can't be bothered or whatever, well, then now you know there's other people that aren't getting that you know paid. So um, I'm I'm kind of glad it all worked out. But you know, I think now more than ever the relationships are, are so strong. You know. Um, and, and it's gone both ways, you know, those, those reps and those owners and those, um, suppliers love like coming to dinner since we've been open again and, you know, paid it back that way. So it's, um, it's kind of nice to, to sort of, um, put a face to the name as well. Like often with these suppliers, you just don't know them from the voice over the phone. You've never maybe met them sometimes. Um, so it's nice to actually sort of connect that way. You'd think a pandemic would be challenging enough on its own, but during this period, your partner, Beck Fanning, also had your first baby. You became a father for the first time during this time. What, what's that been like? Well, it's, it certainly made me uh, change my approach a little bit at, at work. Um, it was a pretty tough time. We, um, yeah, so Lily was born uh, like eight weeks premature uh, in, on the 2nd of May. So she was um, a little bit of a surprise. Um, you know, it all kind of happened within like 12 hours. Um, so, uh, it went from like, um, yeah, it's a pretty funny story. So it went from like, you know, uh, finishing up at the restaurant, like going to get into bed to go to sleep that night and then having to go to the hospital. And then like an hour later, like, Oh, guess what? You're going to be having a baby. And then I, I remember, um, thinking like the next day as well was like, um, we had sold like a hundred uh, meals of this like um, bolognese. It was like f- with fresh pasta. And I just like sent my restaurant manager a text message. Like, <laughs> and what was actually quite funny was like the few texts I sent her at like three o'clock in the morning, she didn't get until like 7am the next day. And it was just like, uh, here's the phone number for this supplier. Here's the phone number for my friend who's a chef who's going to help. And then like, here's a picture of Lily. She was just born <laughs> just in that order. Um, and, um, yeah, so obviously I had to just immediately not be at work and just be, um, sort of at the hospital. Um, and then, um, you know, thankfully, uh, I had some people come and sort of help out in the kitchen and all that sort of thing. And, the team just like really pulled it together and did a, an amazing job that day. They actually had to roll out, uh, my sous chef, Kevin is like just such a machine. He rolled out like 60 kilos of fresh pasta on a domestic pasta rolling machine. <laughs> it took like six hours. Um, so unfortunately I wasn't there for that, but, um, that was uh, one of the sort of <laughs> the dark days of takeaway. Um, but yeah, having, having Lily, um, early meant that she spent the first month of her life in hospital. So we would, um, you know, spend as much time there as we could, but because of COVID, you could only have one parent, um, at the hospital with her at a time. So Beck and I had to, to take turns, 
And, um, you know, for the first month, we, we never actually saw her together. So that was quite challenging. Um, but, you know, it's definitely made me look at um, my sort of work-life balance a little bit more now. Um, and it's kind of, it just seems like doing less customers at kind of a higher price point really has brought a lot of things into alignment. Uh, before when we you know when we first opened our menu was like seventy dollars and you know for doing 10 dishes with the ingredients we use that was like we had to like pack this place full of people which was like stressful enough just trying to attract that many people so you know doing less customers you know we can do a better product not that much more expensive price and you know we can all work less which means i can spend time time with Lily you know I'm actually taking a night off a week now which I never did before um you know so it's really um made me hand over a lot of um a lot of sort of responsibility to the staff and and they're just taking with strides they're really performing and actually enjoying more responsibility so I think and, and contributing more because of it so I think it's like actually COVID and becoming a dad I think it's all made me it's like it all come at once but it's really made me like sort of smack me around the head and sort of think that like there has to be a smarter way to do this and and rethink a lot of things and um and now I can sort of just sit back and and sort of observe a bit more and and be a bit more strategic rather than just making decisions on a whim and um and just not being completely exhausted all the time I think it's just you know sometimes you need to shake up to sort of you know see the light and it's um certainly we've definitely had that so it's been it's been good there's been a few people on the series that have described this period of time as a chance to be a a great corrector in the industry and given the changes that you've had personally and your perception and changes in regards to how you operate your restaurant do you think that's going to happen across the board with restaurants i think it'll have to it'll have to because when you start to see people um like make change and that echoes through the industry Others will have to follow suit or no one will work for them. You know, well, you know, maybe, maybe now that, you know, chef shortage might be less of an issue than it used to be. But I think there's still a finite amount of people who are in the industry and are skilled craftsmen at what they do. So I think, you know, um, everyone's sort of changing models and making people work less and, and, and focusing more on, on what you do do well and, and not trying to just, make decisions on a whim i think it'll end up going going in a in a direction where um everyone will have to follow suit otherwise you know you just you just won't have anyone or you know you won't be able to compete because you'll be outplayed i think a little earlier you mentioned about the vision of your restaurant at arthur you know being a low part of the local community but also somewhere where pe- people go to celebrate that's not in the city um, has has that model changed? Do you think moving forward? What's what's your thoughts about the next couple of years with the restaurant? Yeah, like I definitely think. Well, I mean, we're not going to have tu- tourism for a long time, and you know, thankfully that wasn't a huge part of my kind of business anyway. You know, I feel like if you, our, our, we've always wanted to be here for decades. You know, we want to be an institution. You know, we've signed a very long lease, and I would like to to double down on that at some point, but. You know, I think that that requires a group of people that enjoy what you do for a long period of time. So that requires people who, you know, live locally or are, are close by to, to continue to enjoy that place again and again. Um, so as far as um, what we look to do into the future, I think it, it's it's more of the same, but it's, it's just continually... Um, refining what we do i think a really good example of someone who's mastered that is the guys at six penny i think like they have started with an idea and and it's and it's still the same idea but they've just like cleared away and and refined and and like really honed in on on what that is and and just absolutely nailed it and you can see their progression over what they've been there like nearly 10 years now or something like that and it's it's just um it's just razor sharp now it's just so good and i just would like to to sort of go down that path and just you know keep doing what we're doing and just getting better every day and, and not be held to you know um standards of, 
of other people, but just our own and, um, and, and just do what we like to do and how we like to operate, um, which is a little differently. Well, I came in and ate at the restaurant. I'm not sure how long ago it is now. The pandemic sort of warps time. Um, but it was definitely one of the most inspiring uh, meals and incredibly affordable um, that I had experienced. Um, what's, what is it that you love about what you do? Because it, it feels very generous when um, you eat at Arthur um, and a very warm and a, a very loving room. And yet it's sort of set very high above just being a regular local. You know, what, what do you love about what you do and executing that? I, I just feel like if you're going to do something, you just want to do it properly. And, you know, I think um, despite it being like quite a casual, warm room, you can still, you know, show finesse and technique and, 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 uh, and excellence uh, in what you do, even it's in a, in a casual kind of setting or in a casual kind of presentation um you know it it might seem quite i don't know i i i, I hopefully i hope it doesn't seem sterile in any way because you know we're we always are having actually a lot of fun um doing what we do and you know it's it's the model that we've chosen which allows us to to do it um so yeah i think yeah we just want to continue to have fun and you know just like cook what we want to cook and and i mean kind of everyone says that but um it, it's just like a little family you know we're just a, a group a small group of people you know i actually don't really look at resumes when i hire people i don't i just hire people for their personality you know anything can be taught to a willing you know recipient and we just want to bring in those people who want to be a part of what we do and and that's what's growing like that's bringing those new people in is what's changing it and making it better um, so yeah, I, I guess I just want to, um, just because it, it's, it's a good price point and just because it's a casual place in a neighborhood doesn't mean that it can't be like really excellent, um, in, in a casual sense, you know, and, and all, like all of those things sh shouldn't be missed just because it's, um, you know, a, a neighborhood place. Um, and, and that's what allows us to, to shine bright against, you know, other places. So I, I think it'll serve us well, hopefully. Well, Arthur is a wonderful expression of Australian contemporary um, restaurants. And it's also, you know, a, a great model for restaurants moving forward, I think, in regards to viability, which is really key right now. Um, Tristan, it's been amazing talking to you. Um, we finally got there. I know I got in touch early on in the series. Um, but you've been a bit busy being a dad as well. Yes, um, very busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep in touch and um, really appreciate you sharing your story today. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. It's been, it's been great. Thank you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>